soul and the Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. song this evening. Very convicting, isn't it? Well, we started this morning in Acts chapter 10. We'll continue there this evening. This will be the third lesson of the Acts class. Someone asked me today, was these two going to be the same lesson? I said, no, I won't do that to you guys. So, Acts chapter 10. 
could help us this evening. I was got back from preaching at um, Blackwater this evening. I was sitting there at my desk going over my notes, and I was trying to <clears throat> mark out stuff. Not that I was trying to do away with stuff, just that there just wasn't going to be any way to get it all in before the Super Bowl is actually over. And so I um, thought I'd cut a little bit of it out. Just kidding. Acts chapter 10, we made it through verse 17 this morning, I think it was. We'll actually look at one more thing and starting in verse 17 in just a moment. Let's pray together, and I'm not going to do a lot of um, review or anything like that. We know what's going on in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius is a centurion. He's a Gentile, and he's been praying and fasting and uh, seeking a help from the Lord. The Lord has told him to send for Peter. He has sent for Peter. And, of course, the Lord has had to give Peter a vision of this sheet with these clean and unclean animals let down from heaven three times to convince Peter uh, that the Gentiles was able to hear the gospel and be saved. And so that's about all the introduction that I'll give, and we'll start right in verse 17 after we pray. Father, we sure love you. We sure thank you for the opportunity to preach again today. Uh, we thank you for this good day that you've given us. I pray now that you will help us. Uh, Lord, please help us to be uh, understandable. Please help us to be interesting. Uh, help us, Lord, to be able to keep people's attention so that we can learn the Bible together. I pray for that. Please use me, Lord, to speak the truth in such a way that it encourages our, encourages our heart and helps us to have a desire to do those things that are pleasing to the Lord. Father, well, for all that you do, we'll certainly thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 10, verse 17, says, Now while Peter died, the Spirit of God said, says, Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. Now, I certainly don't believe it's any coincidence at all that God taught Peter this lesson just before Cornelius' men got there. And I'll, I'll tell you why that is. I believe that God gave it to Peter exactly when Peter needed it. Oftentimes, I think the Lord allows us to learn truths from the Bible or understand truth from the Bible exactly when we need that. Now, the, the thing is that's important for you and I is to be in a position or in a place where when the Lord wants to teach us something or has a desire to teach us something, we're in a teachable mindset, but we're also in a place to receive the instruction that the Lord is trying to give to us. So we need to be in the right place. We need to be prepared, amen, for the next step that God has in his plan for us. To be that way, I think we should be faithful to, to reading our Bible. I think we should be faithful to praying. I think we should be faithful to studying. And I also think we should be faithful to hear preaching and be present when there's teaching and uh, preaching being done so that we can learn. I, I don't know about you, but I love to learn stuff from the Bible. I like to hear things from the Bible. I, I like to hear things that I already know preached again, too, amen, uh, to be uh, strengthened and encouraged in those things. So we need to be putting ourselves in a position to hear from the Lord. We, we think about these men that were going to Peter, but Peter put himself in a position to hear from the Lord. Verse number 19 says, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent from, unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Now, there's a lot of things there. We're not going to try to cover everything that's in those verses but I do want you to notice that in verse 22, Cornelius is called a just man. Now, there are, there are seven men, seven men in the Bible who are called a just man. Noah, first of all, is called a just man in Genesis 6, 9. John the Baptist is called a just man in Mark chapter 6 and verse 20. Joseph of Arimathea in Luke 23 and verse 50. Joseph in Matthew 1 verse 19. Simon, Luke 2 verse 25. 
Cornelius here in Acts 10, 22, and one that surprises me and probably surprises you if you think about it, is Lot in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 7, where the Bible says, speaking about and just Lot. Certainly we know how Lot's life was. We would never know that he was a just man apart from the Bible telling us just such a thing. Now, as far as the verses themselves go, what a tremendous opportunity Peter is being given in this situation. Peter is being given an opportunity to go and preach the Bible to a group of individuals who are, according to what we know from the Bible, if they're anything like Cornelius, they're, they're respectable, God-fearing, lost people. What, what preacher in his right mind would not like to have an opportunity to go preach to a, a group of individuals who are desiring that you tell them about the Lord? And, and they're lost. So Peter has a tremendous opportunity here. And this is the kind of, of, of opportunity or invitation that doesn't come along uh, very often in our lives. But when we get an opportunity like that, we certainly are excited about it. Now, the application here in this whole situation is the fact that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He wants, he wants everyone to be saved. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile or whatever the case may be. Uh, the Lord has a desire to have people saved. And so maybe the Lord would, would see fit to send you and I to individuals who are in this mindset needing salvation. Or better yet, what if they send for us? Like they did Peter. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Uh, so that we could tell them about the Lord. You say, Preacher, I just don't believe that's possible in the day that we live in. I do. I believe there are still folks who want to be saved. I believe the Bible is, is very uh, true when it says that the fields are white already under harvest. So I certainly believe there's folks who desire to be saved and want to be saved. Wouldn't it be a blessing if we could get connected with those people and share the gospel with them? Now, verse number 23, the Bible says... Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So Peter invites the men in that's come to retrieve him. They stay the night there. They leave the next morning, and they head down to Cornelius' house. Verse 24 says, And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell in his feet and worshipped him. A couple of things. First of all, Cornelius is anticipating the arrival of Peter. And uh, he, he, he doesn't know exactly what Peter is going to tell him. We'll find that out in Scripture here in just a moment. But regardless of the message that Peter has, he wants his friends and acquaintances to come and hear that message. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be great if we had that same kind of, I mean, some of you probably do. We have uh, I'm certain in, numerous times in our, in our past before. But the Bible says he called together his kinsmen and near friends. I, I like that. The preacher's coming. We don't know what he's going to say, but he's coming. And we want to hear what he's got to say. I want my kinsmen to hear what he's got to say. I want my friends to hear what he's got to say. And so he gathers this crowd of folks together. And the Bible says, as Peter was coming in, in verse 25, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But I want you to notice, first of all, before we get to the worship that we know is, is not acceptable, I want you to notice some things about this that I, that I do like, and that's how respectable this centurion is. He's a lost man. He doesn't know that he's not to be worshiping Peter. And he's glad that he's there. He's, he's very respectful for the fact that I've sent for this man. The Lord, the angel, has told me to send for this man. I've sent for him, and he's come. Now, I, I don't know. We, we'll talk about this maybe in the next verse. But I don't know if he, if he is aware of what has taken place in the previous chapter where the... Uh, where Dorcas or, or Dorcas or Tabitha has been, has been raised from the dead. I don't know if he's aware that Peter was part of that or not. I don't know about all of that, but I know he is glad that Peter has come. He's excited that he's coming. He worships him. And uh, I, I think uh, we, we have to agree that Cornelius was grateful for the ministry of the soul winner. I don't know about you, but I'm certainly thankful for the folks that told me about Jesus. I'm thankful for my parents. They're the first ones, obviously, to tell me about Jesus. I'm, I'm thankful for Sunday school teachers as a child, a, a preacher, uh, in the church that I grew up in. They told me about Jesus. What a blessing. I'm thankful for those people. 
Don't you want to be one of those folks that someone else is thankful for because you told them about Jesus? So Cornelius is coming. He is respectful. I mean, Cornelius, Peter's coming. Cornelius is respectable to him. And, uh, you know, the, the Lord holds high regard or holds folks in high regard who share the gospel with others. In fact, I, the, only, the only time you'll ever hear that you have beautiful feet is if you carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to someone. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Listen, there's, there's a, no way that, that we would consider someone, what an ugly part of the body. You have, you have beautiful feet. You know, what make, you, know what, you know what makes your feet beautiful? If you carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the places where the Lord wants you to carry the gospel. What a, what a blessing. Now, as far as this biz, business of worship, the Bible makes it very clear that we're not to worship man. In fact, first of all, no man is to be worshipped. You find that in Acts chapter 10 right here in these verses of Scripture and also Romans 1, 25. No other God is to be worshipped according to Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. No angel is to be worshipped according to Colossians chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 20. The devil is not to be worshipped in Matthew chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 9. The Antichrist or the beast is not to be worshipped, Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. Only God himself is to be worshipped, according to Matthew chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. And so Peter does the, does the right thing. Look at verse 26. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. So Peter is refusing to be worshipped. Now, that crowd... That falsely teach that Peter was the first pope. He is certainly, he must not have been a very good one. <laughs> if he was the first pope, he wasn't a very good one. Or either all of the popes now are not very good ones. Because they certainly are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Peter will not accept worship from a man. And not only will those Catholic popes accept worship from a man. They expect worship from a man. And so Peter certainly was not that. Also, uh, these these popes, you know how they they. they you're not to be married and all that stuff. It's obvious from the Bible that Peter was married. Uh, he, the Bible speaks of the fact that he had a mother-in-law. And so we, we know that they are certainly, Peter was certainly not the first pope. Now look at verse 27. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. Ain't that a blessing? Praise the Lord for a group of people that will get together to hear the preacher. Cornelius desired that his kinsmen come. He desired that his friends come. And so they've gathered together. The Bible says there is many of them. In verse number 27, And he said unto them, verse 28, You know how that is an, un, is an, an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And so Peter here, he confesses to Cornelius that the vision that the Lord has shown him in the previous verses, back in verses 11 through 17, Peter has got the understanding of that vision correct. And so he, he tells him that he is understand. God has showed him that he should not call any man, regardless of his nationality, regardless of who he is, common or unclean. Now, verse 29, the Bible says, Therefore, Peter's still talking, Came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. Peter doesn't even know what Cornelius wants. The Lord, the Spirit, if you, mention, if you remember when I read that just a few moments ago, the Spirit told Peter that there were some men at the gate and they were looking for him and for him to follow them. Peter didn't even ask him what Cornelius wanted. The Lord, the Spirit told him to go, and so he went with those man, men, and he gets here. And in verse number 29, he says, I ask therefore for what intent have you sent for me? Now, it says he went without gainsaying. Let me just mention one thing about this, uh, this word, or two things maybe. Um, the word gainsaying carries two meanings. It means to say against or to oppose. So Peter, he certainly didn't object. He did not object to going with these men that came. And it also means to seek funds before complying. 
Peter wasn't interested in an offering. He didn't go because uh, they were going to, you know, raise a big offering for him and, and give him a big love offering. No, he went because the Lord told him to go and he was obedient to what thus saith the Lord. Now, so he asked him, he asked, he asked Cornelius, what, for what intent have you sent for me? Look at verse number 30. Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Now, I, I hate to, to rehash all of this angel and man and all that stuff again, but in, in Acts, he, here he calls this, in verse number 30, he calls this a man. In verse number 3, if you look back in Acts chapter 10, in verse number 3, he says, He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of, day, of the day, an angel of God coming to him. So we see that in verse number 30 and also in verse number 3, that the, the angel, he recognized or he saw this angel of God as a man. In fact, every angel in the Bible, in the Bible that appeared on this earth looked like a man. He didn't have no wings, he didn't have a harp, he didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes and all, and all that kind of stuff. He didn't have wings. And so he appeared to him as a man. Now, there, there, are, there are numerous places in the Bible where we could see that. In, in, in Genesis chapter 19, verse number 1, it says two angels. Verse number 5, it refers them to men, talking about the same people. The, the, I, I think the, the best place to see this repeated over and over and over, where the angels and the men are used, uh, intertwined, is Judges chapter 13. Now, you, you can read Judges chapter 13, you can read the whole chapter, and I would have to go down through here and count how many times they're called angel of the Lord, and how many times they're called man of God, and how many times they're called the man, and every time it is referring to the same individual that told Manoah's wife, wife Samson's mother, that you're going to have a son. And it's just repeated over and over and over. In fact, the Bible says this, in, that, in Judges chapter 13, I'm not going to ask you to turn there because I'm not going to read all of these, even though I have them all listed here. In, uh, in verse number 16 of Judges 13, the Bible says, For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And so Manoah still thinks that he is a man. He, maybe he thinks he's a prophet or a seer, but he certainly doesn't see him as an angel. The very next verse says, And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord. Then you go on down in that whole passage of Scripture in verse number 21. It says, But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. Why did he have so much trouble recognizing he was an angel of the Lord? He looked just like a man. And so it is important. Now, I know we don't have any issue with that, but there, you would be amazed at how many folks out there worship angels. And, and the Bible is very clear about the fact that when they are seen in the Bible, they are seen as a man. I, I like this. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 17, the Bible says that he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. So the man and the angel must be relatively the same size because they're used interchangeably again here in the measurement in Revelation chapter 17. Now, of course, there are cherubims that have angels. The Bible talks about in Exodus 25 and also in 1 Kings chapter 6. There are seraphims in Isaiah chapter 6 that have six wings, but angels do not have wings. I'd like to say a lot more about that, but I will not. We've done that before. Look at verse number 30, Acts chapter 10. Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting unto this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are, are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner, by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, before we finish that verse, I want to make mention of something here in verse 32. That's been mentioned in the, in the passage before already, and that is Simon, whose surname is Peter, and Simon, 
um, a tanner. Now, these, there's two Simons mentioned here in this verse, but there are a total, and you don't have to write these down. They, they won't be on a test. They probably, this probably won't do you any good other than your Bible study. It's important. But there are ten Simons in the New Testament. And so Simon was a very common name. I'll, I'll just mention them to you. And uh, Simon of Luke, Simon Peter, Simon Zelots, the Canaanite, Simon the son of Joseph and Mary, Simon the father of Judas Iscariot, Simon the Pharisee, Simon the leper, Simon the Cyrenian, Simon the Tanner, and Simon the Sorcerer. And so Simon was a very common name in that day, not a very common name in the day that we live in, but it was a very common name then. And so when you're reading the Bible, the New Testament, and you read Simon, you might want to figure out which Simon it is. There's quite a few of them in the Bible. Now, more importantly here from this passage of Scripture, I mentioned just a moment ago, verse 29, and that is that Peter doesn't even know what Cornelius has called him for. These men show up to his to his the place that he's staying, not his house, but the place of his dwelling, and uh, they tell him that Cornelius wants to see him, and he just goes to Cornelius' house. He he doesn't even ask who Cornelius is. Now this could be that he is just being completely obedient to what the Spirit told him before, as far as there's three men at the door and they seek you, whatever they say, uh, do or whatever. It could be that, but maybe he. Maybe he knows Cornelius. I don't know, but whatever the case is, they say Cornelius desires to see you, and he goes. And um, Cornelius doesn't even know what he's asking for. He just says, "He just says, Peter, whatever God commanded you, we want you to command us." Now, this is a amazing obedience. Peter goes without asking why. He asks why when he gets there. And Cornelius pretty much tells him in verse 33, I stopped reading that verse. He said, immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? He said, whatever God has commanded you, that's what we want to hear. I don't have any idea what it is. I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, that's what I want to hear. You know, you, we ought to be that obedient in our life. Whatever God has got to say to us, it doesn't make any difference what it is. Whatever God has in store for us, we ought to be ready and willing to hear what God has to say for us. Now, that's the kind of attitude that we should have. We should be that obedient to the Lord. Look at verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. What a great truth in the Bible. In fact, this is, this is one truth in the Bible that could pretty much be a theme of the Bible. It is, a, it is something that is uh, often made mention of in Scripture. In fact, I, I could give you, I, I will not give you all of them. I have them written down if sometime or another that you would like to have them. I can give you 14 cross-references that have to do with that, that same topic, and probably not worded the same way, that God is no respecter of persons. What a blessing it is that our God is not a respecter of persons. Listen, if He says something one time, it's true. If God says something one time, it's important. But if He repeats something that many times in the Bible, He wants you and I to understand that I am no respecter of of persons. They should encourage you and I that when we have the opportunity to proclaim the gospel, we have the opportunity to tell someone about Jesus, we shouldn't be, well, I shouldn't tell that person, or I feel more comfortable telling that person. No, God's no respecter of persons. Just tell everybody about Jesus. Amen. And so, what a blessing. We shouldn't be treating one person different from another. We ought to be sharing the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I like this. Uh, Peter, Peter was known for a dozen bl- uh, uh, blunders or more throughout his life. He certainly stuck his foot in his mouth more times than, not more times than me, but more times than most people in the Bible. He got himself in all kinds of trouble often. And he really, the only natural ability that, it, that we can find from Scripture that he seemingly has is, is that, that of fishing. fishing. And uh, boy, that'd be a bummer, wouldn't it? But when God called him into the ministry, God's hand was on him to preach. 
And I'll tell you what we need in our day. We need preachers. We need, we need sin-hating, God-loving, hellfire and brimstone, heaven-rejoicing preachers. That's what we need. We need, we need preacher, preachers who will preach the Bible. Our nation needs more preachers, amen. And may God give us more preachers. I, and when I say preachers, obviously I mean, I mean preachers who will stand in pulpits across America and the world and preach the gospel, but I mean just everyday individuals who will not be ashamed to tell the world the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. May God help us to have people who will preach the Bible. Now, we certainly know that right before Christ's crucifixion, uh, there by the soldier's fire, we certainly know that uh, Peter cowered in that day and he denied the Lord. But my, man, in John chapter 21, after Jesus corrected him from that, we never see again where Peter cowered or backed down or let up. He preached to whatever congregation he was before, whether it was Jew or Gentile, God used him to preach the gospel and thousands of people are saved. I, w- I would like to be able to stand before God and say, hey, you remember that day I preached on Pentecost and 3,000 were saved? And then you remember that day uh, just a few chapters later when I preached and 5,000 people were saved? I, I know I messed up a few times, but, but look. Amen. And so, so Peter, Peter preached. What a blessing to have folks who will preach. Amen. Now, there is a couple of things here. One thing here that we, I would like to take a look at uh, in, this, in this passage, in this verse. And that is the fact that it says that God is no respecter of persons. And I make mention of that because there's so many people who say that God is no respecter of nations or that God is no respecter of races. And that's not what the Bible says at all. It says that God is no respecter of persons. Now, the reason, one of the reasons that that is so important is because some cults are teaching that God is through with Israel as far as being his privileged nation. And uh, we certainly know that the promises that God originally gave uh, to Israel, they're, they're temporarily set aside. We understand that. But the promises that God gave Israel are not open season for you and I. And God is st- Israel is still the apple of God's eye. We know that. No one else is entitled to their earthly blessings. And so God is obviously a great respecter of nations. We don't, desire, we don't doubt that at all. And we know that because He has set them apart to receive many special earthly blessings, which they will receive. But here's what we need to understand. There is no Jewish individual... And there is no Gentile individual who stands on higher ground than any other. God is no respecter of persons. Amen. Thank God for that. We stand equally on spiritual matters of individuals. If you're a Jew, you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you're a Gentile, you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Look at verse 35. But in every nation, he that feareth him... And worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, notice again, this is not talking about nations, but individuals. It says in every nation. It doesn't say every nation. It's talking about individuals in every nation. And this this verse has also been used by the cults to preach a couple of different things that are not true. First of all, uh, they, they, they preach that fearing God and working righteousness will get someone saved. You can be saved. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, He that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted by doing those things. It doesn't say anything about that they're saved. I promise you, according to Scripture, Cornelius is not saved at this time. I promise you that. And so what does it mean? It's talking about him being accepted by God in a sense that because of his seeking God, and in a sense as him obeying the light that God has already given him, God has accepted him to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's very important. You're not saved by fearing God and doing righteousness. You ought to fear God, and you ought to do righteousness. But the Bible says the fear of the God is the beginning of wisdom. So it, it takes the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to save an individual. What a blessing. Now look at verse 36. 
the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Now, there's one thing here I think is interesting. Peter changed his message here. He didn't, he didn't change the message. He adopted the message to the crowd that he was preaching to. And he only changed one word. In Acts, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, in Acts chapter 3 verses 14 and 15, in Acts chapter 4 and verse number 10, the last f- phrase here in verse number 39, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. When Peter was preaching to the Jews, he said, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree because he was preaching to the Jews and they're the one that slew him. He's preaching to the Gentiles now and he says, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. He didn't change his message. He adapted it to the crowd that he was teaching or preaching to because the Jews certainly were guilty of crucifying the Lord. Verse number 40, Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. So Peter has preached the the death and the burial of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is now preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has said, look, he was, he was seen of me. He was seen of us. We, he said, I, I had a meal with him. I ate with him. I drank with him after he rose from the dead. And so not, not everyone was privy to see the Lord Jesus Christ after he rose from the dead. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the count is stated to be above 500 brethren besides several other small groups that are mentioned in that passage as well. I don't, I don't know why. In the, you, you don't need that much evidence to prove anything in this world, and yet God gives us a great amount of evidence to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Peter is preaching to these Gentiles. He said that he, he was buried and he rose again from the dead. Look at verse 43. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name... Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now he makes, he makes mention of this in verse 43. To him gave all the prophets witness. Now he's speaking here to a group of lost Gentiles. He does not quote any prophet in particular. He doesn't say which prophet or what prophet at all. He says to him gave all the prophets witness. But his message is that everyone who believes in him, whether he be Jew or Gentile, he receiveth remission of sin. It's not about keeping the law. It's not about keeping the commandments. It's not about your sacrifice, your offerings. You believe on the one who died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and you shall receive remission of sins. What a blessing. Now, these individuals were not necessarily individuals who had feared God and worked righteousness before, but because they were willing at Cornelius' bidding his kinfolk and his friends to come and hear the preaching, when they heard the preaching of the gospel, they believed what they heard, and they were saved. What a blessing. Look at verse 44. While Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. All of them. Not, I don't know how many was there. I know the passage that we read earlier. I don't remember the verse. I'd have to look back. It said many. What a blessing. So we talked about Peter's 5,000, Peter's 3,000. Here we see Peter's many 
amen, that, that are saved. So the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why it's so important for you and I when we're preaching not to preach our opinions or our, our ideas. There's probably, uh, I'm not even going to say it. We, we need to preach the Bible. We need to, we need to teach the Bible. We need to preach the Bible. When we're telling people about Jesus. We need to use the Bible because faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Peter obviously does not at this time have the, the New Testament. But he's preaching the truth, the biblical truth, concerning the, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not, to, we're not to preach religion. We're not to preach the church. We're not to put our faith and our confidence in a man. We put our faith in the word of the Lord. Now, verse 45. It says, And when they of the circumcision which believed, and they of the circumcision which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter... Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So God had showed Peter that this salvation is available for the Gentiles. But he really doesn't know. He really doesn't know how he's going to know or how he's going to have an idea that these Gentiles actually believe the message and receive the message. He doesn't, he doesn't have any idea how that's going to happen. And so when they believe, the Bible tells us that the, the, uh, the, on the Gentiles was poured, was also, on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So God shows Peter that, that these Gentiles, Gentiles have believed and have received the Holy Ghost. Now, now keep, keep, keep in mind here for just a moment. I, I really like, like this thought. Everybody, Peter was the only one that was present on that housetop to see that vision of that sheet go, come up and down three times to convince him that the Gentiles were able to be saved like the Jews were. These six Jews that went with Peter was not privy to that information. Peter may have told them. I don't know that he did or didn't, but he certainly was not there. Those men certainly were not on the rooftop when Peter was allowed to see that vision. So think about this. We know the Jews require sign. God showed Peter in a vision, because Peter is a Jew, a sign that the Gentiles could be saved by the sheep. These six men that go with Peter are Jews. And so God showed those Jews a sign by allowing the Holy Ghost to fall upon those Gentiles. And those Gentiles spoke in tongues, not for their own benefit, but as a sign to the Jews that were present with Peter that God had, in fact, saved the Gentiles just like he did the Jews. What a blessing. So we appreciate the goodness of the Lord. So uh, we know that there was a, a, a great conflict between the Jews and the Gentiles. They had all kinds of problems. They had all kinds of social problems and all kinds of religious problems. There was just a great divide uh, between the two of them. And we know that every time during Jesus' ministry that he uh, dared to ignore that barrier or that divide. Any time that he crossed that line whatsoever, he got criticized, he got in trouble. He had all kinds, he received grief from it every time he did something for the Gentiles. But here he is breaking down that barrier, he's breaking down that wall. And Peter and these few Jews that are with him are witnessing something monumental, and that is that these Gentiles have received the Holy Ghost just like those Jews did back there in Acts chapter 2. And they responded the same way, in fact. Look at verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So here, so why were they speaking in tongues? I made mention of it already. The Gentiles are speaking in tongues not to convince themselves. They're fully convinced They've believed the gospel and they, they, the Holy Spirit has fell upon them. They don't need any convincing. Those Jews that are there with Peter, they need convincing. And so God allows them to speak with tongues. And I like what they do. They're speaking with tongues and they magnify God. Ain't that a blessing? Give glory to God. Look at verse 46. I'll read it again. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter... Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So it's very clear that this group of Gentiles have received the Holy Ghost before 
they were water baptized. They've not been baptized in water. So you can tell that Camelite, when he comes at you with Acts 2.38, yeah, and in Acts 10.47, they received the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. So you can say all that you want to in Acts 2.38 that they had to be baptized before they received the Holy Ghost. But that's not what the Bible says in Acts chapter 10. There's a total opposite there. And so and the, the point of that is, The thing that we've mentioned over and over in the book of Acts, the message is the same. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the receiving of the Holy Ghost is different throughout the book of Acts. And what we know is this, the water had nothing to do with them receiving the Holy Ghost. They received it because they believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing to be saved. Now, look at verse 48. This is different. And he commanded them to be baptized. He commanded them to be baptized. If you remember in the previous chapters up to this point, when folks were saved, they asked to be baptized. You know why? Those Jews were religious. They were following a religion. They they understood that there was some importance to that. These are Gentiles. They're heathen. They have no God. They have no covenant. They they don't have nothing. And now they do. And so Peter commands them to, to be baptized. Now, notice this. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then tarried they him. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. I want you to notice here that this water baptism is not a suggestion. He commanded them. Now, I, I know that this generation that we live in and, and this Christian crowd that, of today, that, you know, let me live my life the way I want to. And, uh, but they were commanded to be baptized. Now, don't, don't go out of here and say the preacher said I had to be baptized to be saved. I didn't say that. These people are already saved. They've not yet been baptized, but they, he commanded them to be baptized. I think you get born again, I think the first thing you should want to do is to be baptized. And so they, they, they were, they're going to be baptized, amen. Now, <clears throat> I, there's something else here as well. I want to be baptized in the name of the Lord. I remember years ago, I was, I was uh, still working at Starrett's at the time. And this guy came in. And I say that because the Bible says in Matthew 28, verse number 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore into all nations. Uh, go, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And when we baptize people, that's what we do. So I had this guy came in one time, and he had been in to talk to me at work, and he had been listening to some preacher. And he said, we, we've been baptizing wrong all this time. He said, he said we're, we're supposed to baptize in the name of the Lord. We're not supposed to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We're supposed to baptize in the name of the Lord. I said, yeah, you're right. And he gave me this strange look. And I'll tell you why it's like I told him. Because there's no contradiction nor does it pose any problems because the Lord is Jesus Christ, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. Let me show you that from the Bible. Acts chapter 1, verse number 6. You, don't have, you can just listen. I'll read these. I, I won't go through them all, and I'll show you. Acts chapter 1, the Bible says in verse number 6, They ask of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time? The word Lord here in this passage speaks of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 34, the Bible says, The Lord said unto my Lord, I like that, sit thou here on my right hand. The two Lords mentioned in this passage is the Father and the Son. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. In Acts chapter 4 and verse number 2, the Bible says, Gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So it's very easy to see that the Lord mentioned there is the Father. Acts chapter 9, verse number 5. Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. And so we see that in that passage of Scripture, the Lord is Jesus. Now I like this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit. And so we see that He is the Father. He is the Son, and He is the Spirit. So the Lord takes in all three. We can go on. Philippians chapter 2, verse 11 says, And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Obviously referring to Jesus. In Jude, it doesn't matter what chapter, verse 5, says the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt. Well, that's got to be God the Father. 
And then in, in Jude verse 17, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 10 where we are, in verse 48, when Peter says to baptize them in the name of the Lord, speaking of these Gentile converts, it is very clear that that word Lord includes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, at the very end here of the chapter, in in Acts chapter 10 verse 48 says, Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. They've been saved. They've received the Holy Spirit, and Cornelius and his family are begging for Peter to stay and teach them more. This is Peter's discipleship program. I made mention of this preaching this afternoon at, uh, at Blackwater that I think we have done a great disservice in our day of people being saved by not going through with instructing and teaching and discipling them as new converts. And so... Uh, they're begging Peter here to stay, and so these new converts, they want to learn more. Did you know that's one great evidence that somebody gets saved? They have a hunger for the Word of God that they never had before. The Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that they may grow thereby. You, one, one great evidence that somebody didn't just make a profession or turn over a new leaf, but that they actually accepted the Lord Jesus Christ is that they have a hunger for His Word. And man, while they have that hunger and that new birth state, we ought to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm, I'm done. This is my conclusion. But you can't miss this in Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9 in Acts chapter 10, these three chapters go together in a great way. The, the man, the Ethiopian eunuch who gets saved in Acts chapter 9 is a descendant of Ham. He's an Ethiopian eunuch. Saul gets saved in Acts chapter 9, Saul of Taurus. He's a descendant of Sham. Cornelius gets saved in Acts chapter 10. He is a descendant of Japheth. Aren't you glad that the Lord Jesus Christ has obviously given us a whosoever will gospel? He truly died for the sins of the whole world. And regardless of your nationality, and you came from one of those three, (laughs) you can know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Amen. Father, we thank you for the Bible.